But now there's a new threat on the road. Drivers high on nitrous oxide behind the wheel. The first thing it does is it gives you a feeling of euphoria. It's used in many medical situations as a, as a sort of an anaesthetic. It makes people feel happy. That's why it's often termed laughing gas. At 11, we've learned a teenager who died near Penn State's campus had inhaled laughing gas. I believe that he'd been at a party and they say that he may have been drinking and also taking nitrous oxide, which is a legal high known as laughing gas. Wilson is pushing for legislation that would ban so-called whippets from being sold at smoke and head shops. They contain nitrous oxide and can be used to get high. But if it's legal, is it really that dangerous? These kids are blacking out. They're dying. Uh, they're dying from the explosions of the NAS tanks. They're dying from uh, huffing this. Teens and young people getting high on nitrous oxide. Young people are buying laughing gas, inhaling it, and getting behind the wheel. In fact, in the Inland Empire, there have been 15 accidents involving the use of nitrous oxide. Or yours at a point. Welcome. This is the Dr. Junkie Show, and I'm author, activist, and opponent of the drug war, Ben Boyce. And today's episode is about nitrous oxide, also known as laughing gas, Nas, whippets, hippie crack, party balloons, and all sorts of other names. It's what your dentist might give you during a painful procedure, and it's probably a lot more common than you think in the illegal drug world. The reason you seldom hear about it is because it's legal. So it's not very often that someone gets a bad batch of it. I've been thinking about this episode for a while. I used nitrous oxide when I was a teenager. It was one of the drugs my friends and I would indulge in on the weekends, or on the weekdays. I used a lot of drugs as a kid. A few years ago, I did an episode on religious experience. It's a tough listen, and I was still new to podcasting. But there's some really cool content there. Plus, I made a couple friends. One of them was Dr. Anderson, who told me he planned to do a nitrous oxide experiment where he would put people in an MRI and then give them nitrous oxide to see what their brains were doing. He had approval and was moving forward with gathering participants. I obviously sent him an email early on volunteering, but then COVID hit and stalled everything. It's been a couple of years now, and I reached out to him a few months back, but he's on to different things now, and the experiment is, for the time being, on hold indefinitely. If he ever does get around to it, I'll reach back out and revisit the topic. But in the meantime, I figured I'd take a shot at unpacking the basics. And I'll start with a few warnings. Number one, as always, I'm not a medical doctor, and this podcast is in no way offering medical advice. I'm here to talk about history and communication, how drugs work, and why we think what we do about them, even though it's often super wrong. Most drugs are dangerous to take while driving, especially when consumed in high amounts. But nitrous oxide is not something you want to use behind the wheel. At all. You won't be in control of your body for at least a few seconds. And as I found out the hard way shortly after being released from prison, that's more than long enough to drive off the road and smash into whatever happens to be in your way. Luckily for me, I only took out a mailbox and then bounced off a curb and back into the road before I came to. But seriously, don't drive when you use nitrous oxide. So what is it? Well, in car engines, nitrous oxide, or NAS, breaks down under the extreme heat created in the cylinder as fuel burns. And it produces oxygen, allowing that fuel to burn more fully. So it's basically a turbocharger without any moving parts. It also lowers both the heat and pressure produced during combustion, allowing more horsepower to be produced and more fuel to be burned without your engine blowing apart. NAS is the most common place to get nitrous oxide in party-sized canisters. If you ever see someone walking around a gathering and selling or giving away balloons, that's probably from a canister of nitrous oxide that was sold to go inside a car. But more commonly, the nitrous oxide consumed on the streets comes from small canisters that look exactly like the CO2 canisters you might have used for paintball guns as a kid. They're sold in food stores and sometimes in head shops as whippets or whipped cream gas because they work great to fluff up made-from-scratch whipped cream while propelling it out of the canister. Nitrous oxide is odorless, mostly tasteless, and when you inhale it, it feels kind of like the opposite of smoke going into your lungs. Before we get into what happens when you inhale nitrous oxide, 
I want to trace a bit of brief history about where the drug came from. In 1772, Joseph Priestley, an English chemist, discovered nitrous oxide when he put iron filings into nitric acid. He heated the container and inhaled the fumes. Of course, science was a bit different back then, and he noticed a fuzzy, intoxicated feeling. He referred to this strange gas as phlogisticated nitrous air in one of his books, but it didn't really pick up any steam until a long time later. Throughout the 1790s, nitrous oxide was studied in labs and found to be a likely source of pain management during operations or amputations. But instead of making its way into the medical establishment, it instead made its way into the public, appearing at parties and carnivals as a gimmick. That's where the term laughing gas came from. Even though a few doctors did try to press for its use in medicine, they were largely ignored or even discredited by the rest of the medical establishment who apparently preferred to do surgery without any anesthetic at all. Remember, this was a time when medicine consisted of chopping off infected limbs and injecting mercury through lead needles. When doctors performed painful procedures on patients, they often had to hold them down and give them a stick to bite on. It wasn't until morphine became widely available in the early 1800s that doctors realized there was actually a way to turn the pain receptors off during torturous procedures. And once it was easy to get, morphine was more than enough for most doctors, who'd become so used to just accepting their patients' torture when they did procedures that it seemed like a bit of a miracle drug. So it wasn't until 1844 that nitrous oxide got another shot at mainstream medical use, when a dentist named Horace Wells attempted to demonstrate its effectiveness as an anesthetic during oral surgery. But unfortunately, that demonstration failed when the dose was incorrect and the patient cried out in pain, causing many in the crowd to chuckle and leave. The next year, Wells redid his demonstration, but this time he used another gas called ether, successfully I might add, and it became the norm instead of nitrous oxide for the next 25 years. By the 1930s though, nitrous oxide became popular in both dentistry and medicine. And by the time I started popping whippets in the 1990s, it was relatively easy to find, and it was relatively affordable because of its legal consumer applications. Back then, I knew a lot about nitrous oxide before I ever took it, and all of what I knew was wrong. I remember an episode of Chips that was already a rerun when I was a kid. I'm not that old. And in it, Paunch responds to an auto accident, which has caused canisters of nitrous oxide to start leaking. Do you know what that is? As he arrives on the scene, there's nitrous oxide gas billowing from the crash. But Paunch doesn't notice that he's getting super high. I can't think of a better way to misrepresent nitrous oxide. It's called hippie crack because the buzz sort of resembles that heavy, wompy five second rush that comes with smoking cocaine. You can't not notice it. It's everything in your world for a few seconds. Although, unlike crack, it doesn't come with that nasty give me more hunger or that depleted feeling of ickiness. But that wasn't the worst they did in that episode. Here's some audio I dug up when I rewatched it before recording this. Well, that, that's nasty stuff, man. Oh, thank you, doctor. Hey, I'm not kidding. That stuff will make you hire the jig of martini. And it can really flip you out. So Ponch does his thing at the accident, then heads off down the freeway on his patrol motorcycle, unfazed. But within a few miles, he starts shaking his head like you do when you're driving and feel kind of tired. And then things get really weird. He drives on down the freeway, swerving from lane to lane, apparently still entirely unaware that he's high at all. I've seen a lot of other depictions of nitrous oxide on television too, usually as party balloons that aren't fully discussed in the script. But I've never seen a depiction that rings true to the actual experience. And that's not surprising, because if we actually knew that nitrous oxide is one of the most popular recreational drugs in certain parts of the world, and that plenty of people like me, and like more than half of those I asked about it before recording this, have used it frequently throughout portions of their life without developing any major issues, 
aside from a wompy headache, which sometimes follows the wompy buzz the longer you use it, we'd probably know a lot more about it. So what's it do? Let me first just say that, much like injecting cocaine, words don't really do justice to this drug. You can understand what's happening to make you feel a certain way all day long, but if that description seems entirely insufficient to convey the actual experience, then it doesn't really work to effectively share it with others. And so here we are again, in the land where flesh and blood are non-transferable to media like text or podcast audio. But I'll do my best here. Dr. Judy Grizzle once called alcohol a sledgehammer because of how much it actually does in the body and how many different systems it affects. Nitrous oxide might be a good runner-up for that title. And it doesn't do simple things like cocaine or heroin. It does all sorts of stuff that's kind of hard to explain in regular language. It starts with NMDA receptor sites, not MDMA, as in Molly or ecstasy, but NMDMA, as in the place in our brains where the neurotransmitter glutamate attaches after traveling across the synapse between two neurons. Glutamate is a cool neurotransmitter because it isn't actually a neurotransmitter. At least, it isn't just a neurotransmitter. It's also an amino acid, like those we get through our diet. But since it's too large to cross the blood-brain barrier, it has to be synthesized in the brain. In the neurons themselves, actually. And there's a lot of glutamate in our brains. It's used in almost half of all of our brain synapses. Almost anything that is excitatory. If I'm already losing you, remember, there are billions of neurons in our brains but most specialize in just one neurotransmitter, like dopamine or serotonin. Those that specialize in glutamate are typically, but not always, the circuits that make us move or that excite us in some way. Glutamate is just the signal that travels across the synapse between neurons to pass the message forward. Nitrous oxide acts as an antagonist at glutamate receptor sites. It latches onto them because it mimics their shape, but it doesn't activate the neurons like glutamate does. That means that any glutamate that comes along in the meantime doesn't work because it can't dock. The port's already filled with nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide also acts on both alpha-1 and alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. Adrenergic as in adrenaline and noradrenaline, aka epinephrine and norepinephrine. It stimulates these sites, leading to somewhat energized feelings. I used to do experiments where I would use drugs like nitrous oxide, the ones that seem like they really get us the highest, for lack of a better term, and I would try to recall things or to do math equations while the ringer was going on. And I was always surprised when I could, when I never lost traction and instead managed to experience the moment in HD clarity despite being very distant from what my typical experience of life is like. I imagine that adrenergic receptor stimulation has a lot to do with that. The alpha-1 adrenergic receptor is also activated when we have a so-called head rush, which explains why the feeling of nitrous oxide, in many ways, resembles the experience of a head rush. Nitrous oxide is also an opioid agonist. It stimulates all three opioid receptors, mu, kappa, and delta, and it activates the dopamine pathway. On top of all that, it also increases respiratory rate and blood flow to the brain. But it can have some very negative effects as well, especially if taken in large doses for extended periods of time. One study I read preparing for this episode included 28 patients, all bedridden by the time they entered the experiment, and all doing hundreds of whippet canisters of nitrous oxide a day, and all suffering from vitamin B12 deficiency. Nitrous oxide reacts with the vitamin B12 in our bodies and causes it to become inactive. This can lead to deficiency, tingling in your fingers, or difficulty walking, and eventually even anemia. It's probably not a good drug to put on your daily consumption list. And given its super short half-life, its debilitating effects, and its gift of a terrible headache to take with you when you go, it's a wonder it's as popular as it is. Also on the list of dangers associated with nitrous oxide consumed outside of a medical facility is throat or lung frostbite from canisters that haven't warmed up. When you release the pressurized gas in whippet canisters, they freeze the edge of the balloon in the cracker, 
That's the tool we use to get the canister gas to go into the balloon. And if you don't let that gas warm up before you inhale it, you can do some pretty nasty damage to your lips, mouth, and even your lungs. Since nitrous oxide comes with a massive head rush, some of the most common injuries come from users who fall down or pass out. I've always thought it was kind of weird that it's so popular at raves for this reason. You need a safe place to sit down when you're using it. There are a ton of myths surrounding nitrous oxide, and I hear new ones all the time. But the biggest I can address is it does not produce its effects by starving the brain of oxygen, which is what I was taught as a kid. Now in medical settings, 50-50 ratios of nitrous oxide to oxygen are administered to avoid any brain damage. And of course, when you're cracking canisters for whipped cream, it's impossible to do this. So it is possible to experience issues related to loss of oxygen because we can't currently buy the safe mixed gas. There's also some interesting environmental issues associated with nitrous oxide. It's a greenhouse gas. It's almost 300 times more effective at trapping heat than carbon dioxide, and it definitely contributes to climate change. But it only makes up 5% of all greenhouse gases. And nitrous oxide used for anesthesia accounts for less than 1% of total nitrous oxide emissions. So don't worry too much about the gas you're inhaling doing damage to the planet. But the canisters, on the other hand, the ones we're forced to buy it in, since it can only be sold for whipped cream, those are a problem. They're usually tossed in the woods or dumped with the trash, and there is a lot of these things sold every year. A hit of nitrous oxide lasts just a few seconds, and we often load more than one into every balloon, then breathe it in until we can't hold the seal anymore because of the head rush. That's a lot of trash, and many places won't recycle the canisters because of the danger of blowing one up. Nitrous oxide kicks in fast. Anything you consume via the lungs does, because that's what the lungs do. They deliver gaseous elements rapidly to the bloodstream. It also wears off fast, like super fast, within a few seconds of getting it out of your lungs. Almost all of the nitrous oxide we inhale is exhaled in the same form. We don't break it down, but we can't catch it because by that point it's mixed with all of the gases we exhale with it. Nowadays in the United States, nitrous oxide is actually a little less popular than it's been in the past. That's because in part of its short half-life. It's still incredibly popular in the United Kingdom and the Netherlands, but in the U.S., we prefer longer-lasting drugs with our raves and parties like MDMA and other uppers. But I wonder, as the cycle of popular drugs turns, when nitrous oxide will, once again, be all the rave in the United States? Probably renamed to keep the kids thinking they aren't using their parents' boring old drugs. And if, when this happens, we'll see the same fear-based, don't-do-it-or-you'll-die information campaigns that we've seen with so many other drugs in the past, or if we might try another route. There are a lot of horror stories out there about people who claim to have used nitrous oxide, sometimes just a time or two, and suffered terrible consequences. And of course, those stories get a lot more attention and amplification than the millions of weekly stories from those who just use it and then get back to life. It's hard to separate the fear-mongering from the sincere attempts at harm reduction. With nitrous oxide, at least we seldom have to worry about bad supply or contaminated products, since it's sold by legal producers. But we do still have to worry about hypoxia, aka lack of oxygen, because we can't add the O2 that medical providers can with their fancy equipment. And since it's a drug that's so short-acting, and, for most of us who use it, so shortly a part of our lives, it's really hard to find legitimate information about it. That's the biggest problem with the war on drugs right now. As for me, I haven't used nitrous oxide in more than half a decade. I thought about it before this podcast. But that's not because I have a problem with it. I just haven't really felt the desire, and when I do have that sort of itch, I usually prefer to use longer-lasting, less intense drugs. Call me old, I guess. So no whippets for me this weekend. But if you're going to use nitrous oxide, follow safe use practices and take some vitamin B12 in the days following your adventure. Love yourselves and the addicted people in your life. I'm Ben Boyce.
you're still here, you might want more. So consider checking out my book, Dr. Junkie, One Man's Story of Addiction and Crime that will challenge everything you know about the war on drugs. You can get it wherever you buy books. If you want to know what the world would look like if drugs were legal, or why we develop tolerance and sensitization to drugs when we take them for extended periods, or if you just want to know why I went to prison, check out the book. 